Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Trusted CI webinar for August 27, 2018. I'm your host, Jeanette dopp -Heidi. Trusted CI is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about Trusted CI can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is NIST 800-171 Compliance Program at the University of Connecticut with Jason Pufall. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. Uh, first, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box. Uh, you can click uh, the chat uh, icon and the chat, little chat window will pop up and you can type questions there. And uh, we are going to try to take questions during the presentation as well as after the presentation. So uh, I will be monitoring the chat and, and attempt to field questions for Jason as he's pre presenting. And with that, I will hand the presentation over to Jason. Welcome. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to spend hopefully 30, maybe 40 minutes or so uh, describing what the University of Connecticut did in, in, in our approach relevant to NIST 800-171 uh, and the DFARS clause. Uh, I'll spend some time on specifics uh, as much as I can and kind of outlining some of the programmatic areas that we really focused on as it relates to some process related work, some documentation related work. Uh, to hopefully sort of fill in some gaps that combine the technical with the procedural uh, as we as we walk through this. Um, and then at the end, actually, I'll, I'll spend a little time on some of those items that I think we continue to struggle with or we know will present some future problems for us that we're trying to address, uh, it, quite honestly, with the hope that some people here will have some great ideas that you may want to share with me offline uh, as we as we look to address some of those uh, and, and maybe provide some food for thought as you look to develop your own programs uh, so that you don't find yourself uh, sort of struggling with the same things. So with that, let me get to my screen. Uh, so the, the DFARS clause, I, I'm assuming that it looks like there's a lot of people on here, almost, almost 100 attendees. Uh, there, I, I did this presentation at Educause about a month and a half ago. And it was, it was an interesting mix in that there was probably 30% of the room that were there because they were interested in better understanding how to establish a compliance program relevant to a DOD research. And then there was a significant amount of the room that was there because they were curious about sort of 800-171 a little bit more generally, uh, perhaps as it relates to some of the financial aid guidelines that were out there. Uh, we'll be focusing here today on just sort of the, the infrastructure and procedures, it should be somewhat applicable to, to both questions that I just outlined, uh, but, I'm, but I'm sure that there are distinctions if we look at you know, protecting specific research data versus sort of your financial aid data, right? That, that, that there's some considerations there as well. Um, see, about a year and a half ago, the Department of Defense established their, their DFARS clause, you can see the number there, uh, specifying that any research containing CUI or controlled unclassified information be protected using the NIST 800-171 security controls. Um, 800-171, if you uh, are familiar with it or, or haven't taken a look even, there's 110 controls across 14 families. Um, it's, it's, reasonably, it's a reasonably prescriptive and descriptive uh, set of controls and I think uh, frankly, we found that as we walked through them, you know, many of them could be met using existing technologies. And, and I'll spend some time on that as we walk through this. Um, if you had CUI in your environment, the, you were required to have the NIST program implemented and the 110 controls met by December 31st of 2017. Uh, for us, we spent about six months walking through um, a compliance program to, to be prepared for that 1231 deadline. Um, I would say, candidly, the implementation of this here uh, represented a more, probably a more formal approach to compliance uh, than, than, than we typically do. We have, we, we have a little bit of HIPAA uh, covered at data here. Um, we do have you know, some other compliance areas, but I would say this was the most formal program that we rolled out uh, to put a comprehensive program in place. Um, 
So the NIST 800-171, and hopefully you can still see this because I'm now getting an alert that my PowerPoint's restarting. Uh, no, it disappeared. Hold on one second. Yep. We're, we're Naturally. here. <laughs> we're here. All right. We should breath. be back. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so NIST 800-171. Uh, one of the one of the challenges that we have found, and I expect you'll find also, is truly identifying what CUI is, right? So in this case, the you can see the the incredibly specific language that it's data that requires safeguarding or dissemination controls pursuant to applicable law uh, for data that is uh, not classified. Um, it we have found it very difficult, quite honestly, to get clarity from uh, the sponsoring agencies or the organization that we're working with, whether or not the data that we're receiving or perhaps generating is indeed CUI. Um, I'll, I'll spend time on that because I think that that's a, that's a really important point. Uh, so as we go forward, I'll make sure to highlight that some, but I think that is something that you want to bear in mind, right? How do you define or identify whether the data that you're collecting or perhaps creating as part of the project uh, is is initially CUI or perhaps become CUI and at what point do you actually need to protect it. Um, the security controls to apply though to any CUI shared by or through the government ent entity, right? So it's possible that this would be a pass down clause where uh, your institution is, you know, the receiver of data from a sponsor that received it from the federal government. Um, you'll want to, you'll want to spend some time discussing with the program sponsors, uh, really what their thoughts are around the, the applicability of 800-171 to the data that you have. Um, it, it, for us, it, I would say it's been, it, it's been reasonably unclear. Every discussion is different, every discussion is unique, and, and frankly, I think we've really landed uh, on a process where we engage, the IT area engages early uh, when research projects work, kind of walk to our, our uh, research area. Um, so that we can have discussions with technical staff at the sponsoring agencies to understand what the data is, and that's and that's going to be an important an important outcome here. So I mentioned that we had about six months of work as we prepared to meet our compliance obligations. Um, it was a pretty large group that convened around this. What we found early on was clearly the IT area, uh, specifically. Uh, central IT in cooperation with our uh, IT partners at the department level, the departmental level, uh, were really critical to defining what the, the technical outcomes would be. Uh, but then, of course, you had sort of specific programmatic needs that were driven uh, outside of the office for the vice provost for research in our area. Uh, we had a, an individual from the, the compliance and risk management uh, department. We have specific faculty, of course, that we queried throughout this process, making sure that anything that we developed would actually meet their needs. Uh, we did have a project manager guiding the effort for us uh, because, you know, as you can see here, there's, there were at least seven distinct entities across the institution that were participants. Uh, so we felt the best way to coordinate those activities was to actually have a formalized project manager. Um, we did not have one when we first started the project. Um, I, I'd say when that was in its more evaluation phase and we were trying to determine what technical controls we had institutionally that we could potentially apply to this program. Uh, but then once we had a, a sense of what our capabilities were, um, we then assigned a project manager to it. So I see a, I see a question already that says, you know, what is in ship? Um, so the School of Engineering it was a big participant of this because Clearly, they, they've got a variety of different DOD research projects. Uh, InShip for us is kind of a re, almost a research incubator. So some of the smaller programs that aren't tied or, or either aren't tied directly to a department or perhaps have collaboration across departments would be coordinated through a department we have here called InShip, and they participated in this project as well. So it's really, uh, it's really a, a collaborative program that we run institutionally to bring a variety of different researchers together on specific projects. Um, they also have a fairly large uh, sort of technology footprint, so we wanted to be sure that they were included in this uh, as it might impact uh, some of the implementation that they've done to date. So 
um, kind of walking through this, I, I, if I were to, if I were to give a rough estimate of the amount of people that we had here, were there were probably 20 or 25 people who were involved in the project at different stages um, as we as we moved through it. Uh, largely, frankly, this was a, a technology-driven discussion, so there was a, there was a huge IT component to this. Uh, but really, we had a variety of checks as we walked through the process to make sure that um, any decisions we made would be sort of implementable um, at a department level or feel reasonable to faculty. Um, here's just a, here's a quick slide that just describes the sort of the number of controls across all of the different families. Um, it's, you can see it's pretty broad. Uh, some of them, you know, access control uh, clearly is, is, is one that we spent a significant amount of time on given just the amount of controls. Some of them we had, you know, reasonably good products in place already you know, around awareness and training and, and incident response, for example. They, they were really, they were really low hanging fruit for us to actually meet. Uh, but some of them required a fair amount more rigor for us to actually cover and accomplish. Um, all of these have one or two basic controls, and then you know the remainder would be the derived controls. And typically, the derived controls just outline with greater specificity uh, the outcomes relevant to the control family. Uh, so we walked through each individual control and made sure that we met them. Uh, what we did, and, and I'm going to bounce out of the presentation here for a second and just try and show you our spreadsheet, if I can get there quickly. So we governed everything that we had from the, from the initial meeting through to the completion with this one gigantic spreadsheet. Uh, we formalized some of this in a, in, a, in a binder at the end that I can describe as well as part of our processes, but I wanted to, to, to show this a little bit. Um, it's not completely scrubbed, so there are some names in here. Uh, but we would walk through, we would outline what the basic controls were for every single control family. We would outline all of the derived controls, and we walked through and, and assigned what we felt were specific technical outcomes to meet every single control. And more relevantly, we walked through all, the all of the technologies, and I apologize that these are small um, small frames. I'll expand just a couple of them so you get a sense of what we are trying to track. We would walk through every single technology or uh, IT capability. So if you look here, for example, Duo two-factor, right, a fairly specific technology. Firewall, again, a fairly specific technology. We have a program at the university called Managed Workstation where there's a variety of different technologies that are involved in patch management, vulnerability management, and, and sort of the you know, PC health institutionally, we would group those into a sort of technology family internally as it represents something here that people actually recognize. So we went through every single control and we would assign a technology to it and have discussions surrounding that to say, is this technology actually going to meet the control? And if not, is there another way that we would do it? So we spent a, a, a significant amount of time on this spreadsheet. Um, you can also see that we assigned what we're describing as universally default, available, or managed, locally managed to all of these. Um, I'll get to that as well in, in slightly greater detail as we move forward. But I wanted to just show an artifact that we used internally to help track all of the items relative to NIST 800-171. Uh, uh, Jason, and again, all of those, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, complete your thought. No, I'm good. Okay. Uh, uh, we had a question come in, uh, I think related to the previous slide or the, and here it says section two of DFARS 252.204-7012 seems to bring all of the data, not just flow down data into scope, uh, quote, collected, developed, received, transmitted, used, or stored, or on behalf of the contractor in support of the performance of the contract. Uh, question, are we not understanding this section correctly? Um, so I'll, tr I'll try to answer that, I think, as best I can. Um, so, so you're right. It, it's not just flow down data, but I think what we've struggled with is just because we've gotten data 
from a contractor or just for, because perhaps we've generated data doesn't, it, it, and, and I'm hoping I, I'm, 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 I'm reading this question correctly, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually CUI. And that, that's been subject internally here to a lot of debate where we've spent significant time trying to determine truly when do we actually need to roll a project into our NIST 800 environment, our, our 171 environment. Um, because it is, the spirit of it is that we need to protect the CUI, but not all of the data that we're receiving is indeed classified as CUI, right, or, 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 or covered as CUI. So we're, we're trying, well, actually, so I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump to a, a one slide ahead, because I think it's just right here. Um, as we walked through all of these controls, we defined a, a, a few key elements here that we wanted to make sure were relevant across the organization, right? And, and in kind of, if you look down here, consistency is, is really one of the major ones, right? It's, it's how, do we, how do we manage with consistency the programs that are rolled into this environment? And one of, the, one of the questions that we have there all the time is we want to make sure that we're only rolling those in that actually have CUI, right? So that we're protecting the data as outlined, um, but not, frankly, not making the faculty adhere to a rigorous pro process if indeed they don't have to. Um, that's a discussion that occurs for each project uh, with the, in our case, the Office of the Vice President of Research, uh, IT, and the faculty members, and, and in some cases, the sponsors, right? So these tend to be, these tend to be somewhat lengthy conversations um, because we want to make sure that what we do is, is sort of reasonable. Uh, the, the commentary that we had from faculty was they wanted to have as little responsibility in protecting the data as was practical. And, 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 and I say it that way on purpose, right? Because they're not trying to remove themselves from the process. They weren't trying to exempt themselves from the process, but they also, you know, they wanted to emphasize the work, that, the research work that, we do, that they would do and not emphasize sort of the compliance requirements. Um, when we built this, we decided that we would run this in a manner that if a project came in and needed to be NIST 800-171 compliant, we would move all of their data into a fully virtualized environment. We would provide them virtual desktops. We would provide them centralized, virtualized storage. Uh, we would provide them uh, essentially a separate network infrastructure altogether with the spirit of keeping all data stored within the university, protected by centralized university controls, and not sort of moved out of our environment in, onto any external resources. Um, that was a topic we spent a lot of time on, because, and, and I think there's, there's some drawbacks that we'll get to at the very end of the presentation. Uh, but what we were striving for was a consistency in the implementation an ease of management, but also the ability to make sure that our data is protected centrally, and we were able to provide faculty and their, their say, graduate students or you know, other people on the project, provide them the ability to work on, the, on these projects remotely. Um, that was a key consideration for us. We wanted the, the, the greatest capability around our centralized security controls as was practical. Uh, and we wanted the greatest consistency that we could while while permitting sort of flexibility in sort of both location and sort of operating environments for the faculty. Uh, I think that we achieved that and 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 I can talk a little bit about the the technology as we as we go through this as well. Um, but it was really important to us to say if you are a, if you have CUI, you'll roll into the environment that we've built. We're not going to try and build this individually for each project in you know decentralized labs or say you know leveraging leveraging equipment that might be in decentralized locations because it just gets too difficult to manage and like probably most of you um, you know we're a reasonably small security staff and in a lot of ways this this sort of became almost an ancillary activity for us right it wasn't something that we that we had on our plates 18 months ago uh, we needed to try to figure out a way to comply with this while 
kind of keeping our operational practices and operational expectations uh, as reasonable as we could. Um, I see a question here about how we handle those scenarios where lab instruments need to handle CUI. Um, I'm going to table that to the end because honestly, that that remains a significant uh, question for us. And, and I'll describe that in detail, probably I think the last or second to last slides, if you don't mind. Uh, sorry, before um, you, but before yeah. you move on, we've got a couple of questions that uh, came in before that one. Um, one here, uh, I agree with your definition of CUI. Our debate is around what is CUI? Caution, designing or designating or making inform marking information as CUI when it does not qualify as CUI is considered a misuse of CUI under CFR. Right. Uh, yeah, I think that's an accurate statement. Okay. And then uh, we've got a question about your awesome spreadsheet. Was the spreadsheet you're using <laughs> created in-house or was it a template that you used? Uh, if so, where did you attend, uh, obtain it? Uh, so I appreciate the word awesome. Uh, I would say cumbersome is probably a better word, quite honestly. Uh, we did create it in-house and it evolved. So it was, it was probably a quarter of that size when we started. And then really as we added participants and as we uh, really sort of gathered what we felt was relevant information, we just kept shoving it into that spreadsheet. So it definitely worked. Uh, and I would say it provided us a great way for us to regularly review the status of implementation for specific items. Um, we basically have retired at this point because it did get too cumbersome and we moved almost everything we have into a one note notebook, which I'll, which I'll also get to as well as some of the, some of the procedural pieces of it. Um, we, we do have a sanitized version. We're happy to share that. So if people, um, I, I can either share it with, with you, Jeanette, you can post it, or if people want to reach, us, reach to us directly, I'm happy to share it as well. Um, so I think that answers probably the last, the last question here, the most current question as well. Yep, uh, I will work with you on getting that uh, shared with the community. Okay, um, and so while I say the, the, the spreadsheet I think is cumbersome, uh, I do think that our use of OneNote to document the, the project specific compliance requirements is, is, is a fantastic way to manage that. And, and, and I'll show that as we walk through. Uh, so, you know, the spreadsheet I'm happy to share and I think it'll, it'll serve a purpose. I think the OneNote notebook is unique enough and interesting enough that I hope people will find, you know, some real value in that. The, as you would expect, and I'm guessing you're having some of these, these discussions internally, um, basically, do you, do you put this in Azure or AWS or some other, you know, sort of compliance heavy or regulated environment or do you do it in-house? And we, and we spent a significant amount of time on that. Uh, ultimately, we determined that doing this in-house was the quickest way for us to get this implemented, primarily because we don't have a sort of a robust Azure implementation to date. We've got you know some services up there for some high availability yeah, things like you know Active Directory and, and DNS and things like that, but we don't really have all the same infrastructure in in, in Azure as we do on campus. So the, the challenge of getting you know, good logging data out of, out of Azure was, was more than we wanted to tackle. We knew we had a robust firewall infrastructure here. We've got some sort of malware and, and malicious traffic AI tools and vector that we've got locally. Uh, we've got you know, those managed workstation project products and Duo and a whole variety of things on campus that we felt were implemented in a manner that would allow us to basically leverage them for any of the projects that had CUI on campus. And we just chose to use the data center here, use, in, use technologies here, and focus all of our efforts here. I think trying to add on the learning curve of Azure on top of making sure that we met our compliance requirements um, was frankly just going to be too much in the time frame that we had. If we had, maybe if we had another six months, maybe that would have changed the outcome for us. Uh, but we did choose to do everything uh, on campus. Um, that's not to say that the, you know, the, the GovCloud service that Azure provides, we, we tend to be, we're, we, we leverage Azure for anything that we do in the cloud there. Uh, I think it could actually be a great location for it. Um, we just weren't mature enough at that time to actually, to actually look to do an entire compliance program based on that. This, this slide here is really just meant to sort of at a very high level illustrate 
the flow of data for CUI. We use this very often when we meet with faculty. Um, it gives them, you know, sort of a sort of a logical sense of how the data flows. So, you know, if you're home or you know perhaps working at offsite somewhere, or even if you're on campus, right? We use this to show them that you're still logging into a VPN. The VPN is where we actually enforce two-factor. All of that will pass specifically through firewalls and frankly, you know, a variety of the other controls that are there. And then you will be basically, we'll, we'll call it, you know, proxied for lack of a better word, into the, we call it the secured research infrastructure, the SRI environment. Um, what's important for us to describe to faculty through this slide is simply all of your data is stored here. And regardless of whether you're home or somewhere else that's not on campus or on campus, your method for connecting to that data is still the same. That's the really the important outcome for this slide, right? We want to, we want to impress upon faculty that if you have CUI and you're leveraging our infrastructure, everything is stored locally and protected locally for you and that you have a consistent method regardless of location for accessing that data. Um, we clearly give a little bit more, you know, I'll use more language when we're meeting with them in person, but that is the purpose of the slide. It's clearly not a, uh, not a physical diagram, right? The purpose of it is just to be logically. Um, so we did set up a, no, I'm sorry about this. I, I should have changed this to 110. Um, we walked through a more of a presentation style controls workbook again that we were able to sit with faculty and give them a sense of where where we've implemented technologies that they can leverage um, basically natively or in some cases where they have involvement so we really wanted to describe both to it staff and to faculty at kind of a high level what the control requirements were and then a kind of a high level definition of how central IT was going to meet those um, and then we do the same thing for the derived so I this is this slide is just meant to to represent basically another 110 of these that we would show to say highly interested faculty and then we did in fact have some faculty that really wanted to understand how we were managing their data um, and of course we had almost the exact the exact uh, antithesis of that, we had faculty who simply said, I trust that you're going to handle it appropriately and I just want to get on my research. We really had both sides. Um, when we walked through this, one of the things that was very important for us to demonstrate to senior administration here was that we've, we've made effort to reduce the burden on faculty, uh, which is really the purpose of this slide. So I, sh I, I, I leveraged this slide at one point in one of our um, sort of compliance meetings internally to describe the controls that were that were present in NIST and then how, what the distribution looks like and it's and the workload as it relates to faculty so essentially what we're looking at here is 12 percent of the 110 controls had to be met by faculty and that might be something where they needed to do, you know, they may, maybe needed to work with the locksmith on campus to make sure that they had uh, key card access or, you know, some, some access control for a physical space that they had, right? That's not an IT function. That's not something that I'm going to be able to control centrally. They would have responsibility for that. Um, there were some shared controls, for example, we can provide obviously all of the sort of identity and access management related controls for uh, project participants. However, I can only apply them if I'm given an accurate list by the faculty member of everybody that's participating on the project. And then there's a, a periodic review that will occur internally, likely every six months with, where we'll say, has your uh, has your participant list changed? And if so, can we get an updated list so we can make sure that only those people who who should have access to the to the project data actually do have project data, right? So the the expectation on the faculty is that they give us accurate data, uh, but that really should be a small sort of a small component of what they do. And then on the back end, we'll just make sure that we update all of the access control lists and, and roles as as appropriate. 
Um, so that's the purpose of this slide here, is just to demonstrate that of the 110 controls, 60, roughly 60% 60 of them are simply met centrally, simply by the act of rolling your data into our environment with absolutely no effort at all, 60% of the controls are met. Uh, another 20% of those controls are typically met with the central IT group, the security office, and say the department and de departmental IT people, for example, who might work within the School of Engineering. So again, no burden on the faculty, um, coordinated outcome with the, with the relevant groups, um, but the emphasis being how do we do this sort of operationally consistently uh, in a manner that can be documented and in a manner that actually reduces the burden on the faculty member. Uh, that's the purpose of this. And I think that was a theme throughout our entire project, which was how do we make sure that anything that we do, the faculty member sort of sees the least amount of overhead or burden from. That was, a, that was an important outcome. And I think we actually met that reasonably well. And I think that because we were able to virtualize so much of this, um, it, it actually simplified that significantly. This is a busy slide. And the important outcome here simply is that we defined a set of processes that defined when a project went through the uh, research department, when it initially got earmarked as, a, as having the DFARS clause, they knew then immediately to bring in the IT security group, the information security group, so that we could then be participants with the project sponsors, PIs, and sort of contracting agencies to try to define what CUI was. Um, it, it's amazing the amount of time that we spent discussing what this workflow would be. Um, I think, frankly, there was a, there was a, a lot of discussion that, that went around you know, in, in a sense, why do, we, why do we want to be so specific? Can't we just protect every project that comes in as if it had CUI and in sort of, in sort of impose this structure on everything? Uh, that, was a, that was a long debate. And, and I think we, we really found a good process here to make sure that we, we, the Information Security Office, was involved early so that we could have reasonable discussions about what the data was. Um, so that decisions could be made early and faculty member could then make decisions about how they wanted to move forward. Uh, I don't want to belabor this point, but for us, we found that this, this, this sort of subtle distinction about when we were involved was critically important. Uh, we had a faculty member, for example, who when we approached them and said, we can't get clarity whether the data that you have is or is not CUI, and so we're simply going to treat it as if it were CUI. His response was that he felt the sort of the overhead of working with the data and the controls that we needed to place on the data were cumbersome enough for him that he actually then didn't want to do the project. So he said he felt like if he had known earlier that there was ambiguity about what the data was, he may have made different decisions about whether or not to actually do that research project. Uh, it, it, was, it was a very amicable discussion, but it was an interesting outcome for us to, to realize that some of these grants are really small. Some of the, some of the, the projects that the, some of the researchers are working on, frankly, aren't that important to them in comparison to some of the other work that they're doing. And they may very well want to want to forego those projects or defer them or, you know, or further develop them, whatever that might be, rather than moving forward based on the fact that they had certain compliance requirements and they felt that the, the, the risk and reward wasn't there. Um, it really was the outcome of that one discussion that, that forced us to think a little bit harder about when we have the discussions about identifying CUI and what that process would look like. Uh, I absolutely do not want to suggest that this process works flawlessly every time. We've had some contractors that clearly are, are willing to make a determination about the data that they're providing us and whether it is or isn't CUI. And we have some that, that, are, that, are, less, that, are, that are just less willing to do it. They're either, they'll either tell us outright, we won't tell you and it's up to you to define it, or we've had some that say, well, just treat it like it is and, and roll everybody in. So we've had a variety of different outcomes but it's important for us to have the discussions up front. Um, I'm seeing the, the, 
the screen with questions work through. Jeanette, is there anything that you want to try to address? Uh, first, uh, we have a, a comment from uh, one of our, our friends uh, at IU, Anurag Shankar. He says, compliance is often subject to local interpretation and risk tolerance. For two alternate interpretations to CUI, I recommend slides from a two half-day training sessions presented at the NSF Cybersecurity Summit last week. Uh, he includes links, and I will post those in the follow-up email. And then we've got a question, uh, is there a dollar value where you've seen that that's a break point of not worth the effort? So I'll have to answer no to that. So I've only had two conversations that, that went down that path, right? Where the, where the faculty member said, well, I, I, may, I may or may not want to pursue this given the fact that this, this feels, cumbersome, feels cumbersome. And I think it was less of a dollar amount discussion and I think more of them balancing the, you know, their projected outcome for that project compared to some of the other projects that they were interested in. Um, one was a very low dollar amount. I think one honestly had like a $25,000 price tag to it. And, and, and the faculty members said, well, I, I just don't care. Um, the other conversation I know was a seven, seven figure discussion. And I think candidly that faculty member was probably more frustrated by the fact that all of a sudden he had these new compliance requirements that he didn't have the year before. So one, one other thing that was really interesting to me was, and I'll use that faculty member as an example, uh, that individual had a relationship with his contracting agency for the better part of 15 years where truly they just emailed results data back and forth for 15 years. And then essentially one day, you know, I showed up in his office, right? That's an oversimplification, but I showed up in his office. I said, hey, by the way, prior to December 31st, you now have to meet these 110 controls. And his response was, well, last year I just emailed them the results. Like, why do I need this additional complexity? He was pretty frustrated by that. And it took a little while for us to, for, honestly, for me to get an understanding of where that frustration came from. And it wasn't until I really realized that he'd been, he'd been working under this informal process for 15 years and was struggling over the kind of the, the, the changes, right? He, he wasn't overly technical. He wasn't looking to change his process. His goal was simply to produce results and get them over to his sponsor. This felt cumbersome to him. And we really had to find ways to uh, sort of accommodate what I would say were his unique needs in this, in this process. And I, and I think largely we did, but I'm confident if, we, if you were to interview, you know, say all the people who rolled through here, he would remain the most dissatisfied. And I think it really become, it's really from the, the historic perspective more than the way we built the project, if, if that makes sense. Um, uh, here's one, our binder. Sorry. Oh, sure. <laughs> one more, uh, yep. one more question. Uh, so you're saying if the data cannot be defined as CUI, but the clause is in the contract, assume it's CUI. And then a follow up reply, I think applies to this. <laughs> uh, they are re required to mark CUI when passing it down. So I find it interesting when contractors refuse to do so. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't know if the last comment uh, when, when we when you say I find it interesting, um, I don't know if if Jay, if you're finding it that you are always getting it marked. Um, I would say our experience so far has been that the clause will the the, the clause itself simply gets passed down in the contract, and there we are not getting the data marked consistently, and that has proven to be for us that has proven to be a challenge, um, and then. We're still debating that. I think I think it's fair to say if the data is not being defined as CUI, um, our our risk position is we should treat it as CUI and protect it as CUI. Right? That's clearly the less risky way to approach this. Um, in some cases, though, the faculty push back on that, and we, and we really try to engage the contractor to get more clarity on what the data is. And in some cases, it's really better trying to better define perhaps when the data does become CUI. So we've seen where the data we get isn't actually CUI, but then the processing that we do locally changes, uh, changes its designation, and then we protect it. So we, we, we're still using all the same consistent IT controls, uh, 
but it's at what point in the process does it become CUI and at what type point in the process do we actually need to protect it. So we're trying to be as reasonable as we can with each project uh, while to the best of our ability uh, ensuring consistency because it really is just easier to manage. Uh, so those faculty members that are tolerant and simply say I'm comfortable having all of my data there, clearly that is the easiest way for us to proceed. Uh, if a faculty member says I really, you know, there's, there's these reasons why it's cumbersome, uh, you know, the individual who, who, who asked the question about lab related equipment, for example, where they need to do some analysis with local equipment, uh, in those scenarios, we do need to look at different ways of managing the data and hopefully, you know, if we move it out of the environment, we're moving it out when it's not CUI and when we move back in, you know, at that point, hopefully we're protecting it appropriately because it has become CUI. So we're, we're trying to manage those discussions as well. Um, I think I saw a comment in here uh, at, at one point that, that suggested that, you know, there, there, there's no, this isn't black and white, right? That while there are these, these 110 controls that you need to meet, um, there is flexibility with how you meet them. And in some cases, I think, you know, defining when you need to meet them and when the data becomes CUI. And we, and we tried to have those conversations internally. Um, I, I feel like I'm probably describing a, a, a sort of a set of scenarios here that, that feel almost more ambiguous. I think in a lot of cases, we've gotten great, clear information from, you know, contracting agencies. Um, I'm probably spending more time on the outliers than perhaps I should. But I'm doing that really just to demonstrate that, you know, this isn't black and white all the time. And it does require sort of conversations and certain decision points internally where you're making some risk-based decisions um, with all the people who are involved in the project to include the, the faculty members. And I think it's really important to make sure that they're engaged in this. Um, this is an example of our binder. I'll, I'll pull up the, uh, the sample binder here quickly just to give you a sense of what the, work, what the kind of workflow is. So we've got all of the control families on the left. And for each one that has a, I'll just go to one here. For each control family, we've outlined all of the specific controls, all of the control requirements. And in, a, in an actual project, we would have uh, program documentation linked directly to each page so that we can outline exactly the decision points that we made with the faculty members relevant to each control requirement. So we do document um, the, the, the global set of controls. We'll document, of course, any changes that we make to those. And then we'll have a document for each project that is relevant to any things that are specific to that project, all documented in this format. Um, we originally did this in a, in a Word doc. It works. It was you know, 175 pages long. And frankly, it just felt cumbersome. Having it in a binder style format, we find it's really easy to reference specific controls. It's really easy to walk through uh, the questions with a, with a faculty member. This has been a great document for us. Uh, and we're, we're, again, we're happy to share that if, if people would find that useful. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead a tiny bit just because I'm, I'm in this screen right now. For every project that comes in, we have a, uh, an intake form that we'll walk through, gets us some general background information, gives us specific people who are assigned to a project. Um, you know, I, I don't need to, to walk through the entire thing, but we did create a research, sorry, an intake form that we would fill out for every project. What this actually helps us do is implement their environment for them. So once we get this, this whole document completed, and you can just see there's, you know, the, the whole variety of sections here, once we get this entire document completed, we basically can then create um, essentially IT tickets internally that get routed to each relevant group. And each group can look at what is important to them on this document and create you know, relevant, re relevant uh, virtual desktops, shares that might be needed, assign roles as needed. All of that would be in this document. So it allows us to reasonably efficiently sort of kick off the implementation of a project and then roll a project in pretty quickly all through the use of this document, which is, which is great. Um, and while I'm at it, I'll just walk through. We did put a, a website up. This is on the security office. It's under security services. 
if you want to look at what we put together for the secured research infrastructure. Again, it's, it's meant to be a high level that a faculty member would kind of go to, get a sense of what the SRI environment was, link you to any relevant pages, but also give you a sense of what it was to actually roll through, uh, through that site. So those are kind of the, the, I'd say the major four documents, the, the OneNote document for the binder, the intake form for us to kind of get clarity for each specific project, uh, the spreadsheet that we used really at the beginning, but was, was really helpful for us. And then, you know, the website describes the expectations uh, that the institution has relative to these types of projects. So uh, I would take a look at those as well. Um, I think I'm almost done and I, and I, and I see that we probably have some questions. So that was yeah. an example of the binder. If you, if you want to, yep, let's, let's have you continue and, and finish, and then we'll try to take questions at the end because they're coming in more than we can handle in the time allowed. So go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. And, and, and I'm nearly done. So we developed our own training. Uh, we did not, year, we, so we had SANS uh, securing the human. Uh, we actually just moved away from that to a different product. We, with our HR department, uh, developed because they, they manage a tool that does training internally, uh, developed a 20-minute sort of training session that has attestation sort of at, at different sections throughout it so that we could, we could verify that people actually, you know, paid attention to the training, you know, sort of, you know, represent that they understand the training and then have sign off at the end. Um, it's meant to describe, at its, at its most basic, at a high level, it's meant to describe what their responsibility is relative relative to protecting that data um, that would be their control, right? Making sure that they don't remove it from the environment, you know, taking care to protect their screen if they're working at a Starbucks, like all a whole variety of different sort of useful information for them to make sure they protect their data. Uh, but we did develop a, a NIST 800-171, you know, SRI specific training curriculum that we have asked, or we've mandated every uh, every faculty or participant in a project to go through, as well as all of the IT staff, uh, both centrally and decentrally, and anybody else participating on the project. Um, we kept it short intentionally, um, but, but we also made it a an electronic version so that we could simply hand it out and let them do it at their own time. So that was that was a really useful outcome for us. Um, I briefly talked about how we do the intake form. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move through this a little bit more quickly. I only have a slide or two left. Uh, how we do the intake form, kind of what our process is to review that. And for each project, we do a three month review and then a one, one year review, or we will do a one year review. Uh, so we'll basically put our own cadence around, you know, sort of the, the internal evaluation of some of these projects, uh, just to make sure that everything's kept up to date. And then finally, the, the unfinished business for us. Um, the most complicated one, without a doubt, for us is the shared infrastructure. So it's clear now that we've got projects coming in that are going to look to use our high performance computing environment, which is a shared resource for us. Um, and of course, it's clear that we've got lab equipment that is shared for a variety of projects, many of which won't have the requirement to comply with 800-171. Um, I'll be candid, this is, this is proving to be the most difficult part for us, right? Because it's clear that, you know, some of this equipment is expensive. They're not going to buy equipment dedicated to these projects. Um, how, do we, how do we protect that data for the projects that require it while, you know, continuing to permit uh, sort of the, you know, the ease of access for those that don't? Um, I don't have a great answer for that right now. It, it is, it's the discussion that we're actively having. Um, we were fortunate frankly, to be able to table this. Uh, most of the projects that we have, actually all of the projects that we rolled in to date did not have, either had dedicated uh, infrastructure and we were able to do something specific to the, to the site or location that they were at, uh, or didn't have any sort of lab related equipment at all. Um, we have one that's looming in front of us that's going to leverage both HPC and a variety of shared equipment. And so we're actively working on that. If there's anybody who's interested in having that discussion, uh, I would be, I'd be very happy to, because I think uh, there's a variety of ways to approach this, and I'd be interested in, in people's thoughts around that. Um, application whitelisting, I think we've largely worked that out. Um, we were trying to use some, some Windows-specific tools to provide for that 
they were probably more cumbersome than they should be. And I think we're just moving, uh, moving in a direction of a, of, of a separate product, um, not in the sort of the Windows ecosystem to manage that. Um, and then really binder revisions. It, it's, it's, a, it's a, not a difficult process, it's just one that we need to build into our internal processes to make sure that we're a little bit more rigorous on. Um, and so I think it's, that's there mostly in a, in a lot of ways as a placeholder for us to continually remind ourselves that making sure we keep up with project and programmatic documentation is critical because we want to be able to always represent compliance for all of these. Um, again, here's the, here's the link to the website off of the security page. So that should be pretty straightforward. I am happy to share you know, the other resources that we outlined as well. So I'll get those to Jeanette after the presentation. And hopefully those are, those are valuable to the community. And there's my information if you would like to either call or email me directly. Uh, and we're happy to have conversations and, and again, to share anything that we have. I think we've, we've made our best effort to put a program together that I think was flexible um, and that was sort of reasonable to manage and operate. Um, but I also recognize there's probably some areas where we've made some concessions to meet those goals. Uh, and I believe we've done our best to you know, sort of back those up through documentation and, and the rationale. But I'm, but I'm sure there, you know, there, there's plenty of room here for sort of alternate viewpoints as you walk through that. Uh, and for that, I'll stop because I know we're running up against time and I do want to be able to answer some questions if I can. Yeah, uh, so let me just real quickly post a link to our survey, uh, Trusted CI survey of the webinar series and this presentation. We would really appreciate your feedback. Um, and with that, I will go back to our, our questions. So here we've got a question. Um, in the DOD DFARS context, is there a level between full distribution A slash public release and a marking that will require CUI controls, for example, uh, FOUO, a middle ground. Is FOUO a middle ground? Yep. Um, so I'm going to be honest. I, so that question, I would defer internally to uh, an individual who works on my, on my staff who I think would be able to answer it better. So I. I I don't want to comment on that because I'm not positive of the answer and I don't want to give you incorrect information. But Scott, if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to put you in touch with Paul, who I think can speak much better to you know, the official use only aspects and, uh, and, and sort of some of the middle ground for this. So, it's, so I'm, happy to, I'm, I'm happy to try to get an answered, but I don't want to answer it now. Okay, uh, how about this? What about software development that processes CUI? How can this be whitelisted or audited? So that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, we do have a faculty member who has, uh, has custom built software. Um, the, the way that we've done some of the whitelisting to date has simply been to permit programs that run in certain directories. And, and, it, it, and, and, I'll, and I'll admit, that I don't think that that's the best way to do it. Uh, we didn't have a product that I think sort of met the requirements any more granularly than that. Uh, so basically, we've asked that we've, we've kind of worked with them to make sure that the software runs out of specific directories. Um, and with that project in particular, we did kind of work with them to build in some logging to the application that they didn't have previously. So they were open to, to kind of working with us to identify ways to better comply. Um, but it was a specific development effort on their part to make sure that they added some of those components for us as well as uh, sort of changing the way their application ran. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't very cumbersome for them, and it was, it was, uh, it was a pretty straightforward process. Um, and you were talking about whitelisting. What tool was that? Do you, it, will you be able to share that, what tool that was? Yeah, so there's, um, there's some discussion here about trying to use Silence to actually provide for some of the whitelisting capabilities there, and, and, and I don't think that's its exact intention, uh, you know, the, the, the product's intention. Uh, but we're looking at, at that for other applications, and there is capability of allowing you know specific applications to either run or not run. So I think the the spirit would be can we leverage that tool? Um, if it, it it's kind of early in the process, it may or may not pan out. 
um, and we may end up turning to a different product, but that's our, that's our current line of thinking today. Okay. What are your thoughts on the agencies testing universities for compliance to CUI controls? Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that the question is, is more, do we expect to be audited at some point? And I, I, so I'll, I'll, if, if the person can say yes or no to that, that'd be helpful. But I think I, I'm guessing that's the spirit of it. Um, and she's, yes, she's saying yes. Oh, great. Okay. So this is, so my thought is this, I don't think it's eminent that we're, that we're likely to get audited, right? I think they were only eight months into the, the requirement being enforced. Um, I think I'm not, I haven't had, I haven't had any, haven't had any inclination that there's any reason that we would be audited for our projects. Uh, but we have approached this and it's the reason we put the binder together. We've approached this as if at any time we could be audited and we wanted to show the, to the best of our ability, you know, that due diligence was given to all of these controls relative to each individual project. Um, so we basically approached it like we need to produce documentation at any time and let's make sure we have it ready. But I quite honestly don't think that, I, I don't expect to be audited anytime soon. That, that, that's my gut. Uh, yeah, we've got some comments further down. It says there's no audit for CUI controls by the agencies and uh, yeah. DOD clearly states this in their, in their documents. Okay, so. Right. Uh, how, yeah, my, how, I mean, my feeling with all of this was we had an, we had an opportunity to, you know, we had an opportunity to be ahead of the game for a change where you know the compliance requirement came out we had more or less ample time to deal with it let's make sure that we deal with it deal with it as if at any time we could be audited and put the whole program together sort of in, in the spirit of that and then that's what we've done to the best of our ability yeah so then you're not caught scrambling in case things change that's the hope okay how how about this how are you handling transmission between performers and sponsors <sighs> so i removed that from my last slide saying here were some of the challenges that we had. Uh, so what we found so far is the, the, the data that needs to come in or go out doesn't happen with the frequency that we initially had thought. So we, we spent a lot of time at the beginning trying to identify um, ways to transfer data e either using like SS SFTP or you know, some, some secured sort of web-based protocols that, that were available to us. Um, and then what we found was a, we'd get a data set maybe twice a year and perhaps in, in many of these, we were sending data back up you know, twice a year and the faculty members were actually comfortable physically writing to media and hand delivering it to some of their sponsors. So that, that was the way some of them were dealt. Um, the, there's, a, there's a military, I don't, Unfortunately, I don't know the name off the top of my head, but there is a military Dropbox, a Dropbox managed by at a dot mil address that met the requirements for a couple of our other projects uh, that they managed. And so, you know, they, they were comfortable with the security requirements around that. We have not built a file transfer process that permits a, an external agency to drop data directly into our virtualized infrastructure to date. Uh, and the reason we deferred that was each project that we come that we that we sort of evaluate, we found alternate methods that were kind of easier to do without the training requirements of trying to teach somebody how to use our processes. So we've opted for that uh, so far. I do expect, frankly, I do expect that that requirement to bubble back up at some point. Uh, but we found other methods to get around this for for each project that we've implemented. Okay, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, how do you address research projects where the researcher requires administrative access in order to conduct the research? For example, research developing malware protection software. So we, so we're providing virtual infrastructure to all of these faculty members. So everybody has their own persistent virtual desktop. Uh, if they need servers, we'll provide them with their own project specific server. Um, and if they needed administrative access, we would grant administrative access and we simply log accordingly. So um, I think 
we've gone down the path of saying, as long as we document the decisions around a project uh, and demonstrate that we gave it thought, right? So the, so the controls don't say, you know, only an IT person can have administrative access, right? They're, they're, they're more in the spirit of limited administra limit administrative access to what's practical. I think as long as we define why we felt the faculty member might be practical to have administrative access and we document that and we can attest to it, uh, I think we're comfortable with that. So we don't give it out carte blanche, uh, but we're not adverse to doing it if there's a if there's a programmatic requirement. Okay, and uh, one more. Oh, um, but the controls do speak to separating user and admin activities. I think that Jay is commenting on what you had just remarked. Um, so so I, so they do right. So we'll have separate accounts. Uh, it, it may, it maybe maybe this will help. Uh, we we of course have a, a completely separate account structure for anything that requires administrative access, and we would require that the faculty member leverage you know multiple accounts perhaps for different activities. Uh, but we would log according according to that. It, 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 ho hopefully that helps. He, yeah, um, he replied. Uh, same approach I've been taking. Thanks. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've got another comment uh, here. We have a contract, we had a contract come in where the third party required a copy of our SSP prior to signing. I'm guessing the question is, are you familiar with this procedure? So I'll be honest, I'm not, maybe I should, but I'm not positive what SSP is. Um, so maybe it's procedural documentation. Oh, system security plan, thank you. Um, required a copy of our SSC prior to signing. Uh, so I don't, we, we haven't had that yet as far as I know. I've had conversations uh, with agencies around specifics about how we meet certain requirements around um, the NIST project, but nobody has said, and I want you to send me something that attests that you're doing it. So I'd say anything that we've done so far has been a uh, I'll describe it as an informal conversation to you know, sort of have a have a personal discussion that that gives a certain amount of assurance that we're actually you know, honestly meeting these requirements. Um, and so we really just have conversations around here's the way we meet you know, all these controls and, and they've all been reasonably well accepted to date. And then, of course, we have the documentation you know, once we've implemented anything, if anybody ever had a question. So, yeah, his reply is that he, he was making a statement. Um, more so because oh. they just saw the first iteration or the first request of this a week ago. So maybe it's something that's going to become yeah. common. Um, okay. Fair enough. We've got another comment here. Just FYI, the Under Secretary of Defense Intelligence uh, tasked the, direct, the director of DSS in May of 2018 to provide a report on the implementation of oversight of CUI within six right. months. That said, we are always we are a ways out from the DOD audits, but it will likely be implemented in the foreseeable future. Yeah. All right. Um, well, uh, Jason, this has been uh, incredible. Uh, we've had a, a great feedback from the audience, great questions. Um, I just want to thank you so much for presenting. Uh, I just quickly want to share my screen uh, to show what we've got coming up and um, take any more last minute quick questions. We'll try to take one more question, but uh, we've got, uh, if you wanna know more about our webinar series to view presentations, join the discuss list, uh, submit requests to present, you can visit us at, at trustedci.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is September 24th at 11 a.m. Eastern, and the topic is the SCI Trust Framework with David Kelsey. And again, please take our survey. Uh, uh, let me just uh, post it again real quick. Please take our survey and give us your feedback and uh, let us know if you wanna present, uh, if you've got a presentation topic that you would like to reach the NSF audience. And with that, we will look for any more questions. We've got a few more people still in the room a lot of people are, are saying thank you and that they enjoyed your presentation, Jason. Well, thanks. And, and I, hope, I, I hope it wasn't too fast. It's always a little bit difficult to, uh, to go through it without the sort of the visual feedback of an actual room. 
so I hope I didn't you know, kind of speed through it, but I tried to give as much information as I could. So I appreciate everybody attending. Uh, I appreciate the people who actually stayed extra time and asked some questions. So thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, Jason already uh, allowed me to share his contact info uh, after the presentation. So if you want to talk to him personally or privately off, off the chat, that's fine too. And we are recording this presentation, so it will be posted to our website uh, within a day or so. All right, great. Well, with that, I will uh, just say thank you one more time and I will stop the recording.